All right, on. I'm really happy to be here and um, uh, just uh, integrating my two uh, two primary passions in life, integrating cannabis and psychedelic allies and regenerating agriculture and creating a society that lives in harmony and balance with nature. Um, so my granddad was Dr. Bronner, um, and he founded our company as a nonprofit religious organization to, um, to promote his belief and his insight that all faith traditions at their core are praying to the same divine source, we're all children of that same transcendent mystery, and if we don't realize our unity across religious and ethnic divides in a nuclear-armed world, the next Holocaust, we're going to all destroy ourselves. Um, he had the ovens of the Holocaust behind him. His parents were gassed and killed in Germany. Uh, he himself was a third-generation master soap maker. Um, his granddad, my great-great-granddad, first began manufacturing in 1858 in a, in a town called Laupheim, Germany. Um, so... So my granddad, you know, basically was going around the country lecturing on his peace plan and selling his family's uh, natural Castile biodegradable soaps in a time of better living through chemistry in the post-World War II era. Uh, there was a big move in all kinds of industries to petrochemicals, to fossil fuel uh, inputs. Um, and so in agriculture, that was uh, synthetic nitrogen and fertilizers and pesticides coming out of the war. Uh, uh, we went, we pivoted to this industrial agricultural model, basically looking at soil not as a miraculous living membrane and ecosystem that we must feed to, to produce healthy, nutrient-dense crops to feed ourselves and our children, but rather as a dead inert medium uh, that just holds the plants up while we uh, you know, just bring our crops to harvest with more and more chemicals and fertilizers and pesticides. And this is basically now destroyed one-third of the Earth's surface is under industrial agricultural mismanagement. So uh, when I came into the company, um, my granddad died in 97, and my dad, uh, a year later, um, my dad and uh, mom and Uncle Ralph, uh, my dad Jim Bronner, my mom Trudy Bronner, and Uncle Ralph Bronner, uh, were running the company in the 90s. My, my granddad had basically kind of retired in the uh, late 80s. Um, and my dad was, uh, my granddad wasn't the best dad. He kind of went off to save the world, and his kids came up in a series of foster homes, and my, um, it, my dad's mom died uh, when my dad was two. Um, my granddad financially supported them, but, uh, you know, basically kind of bailed as a father. And, uh, and my dad had a lot of anger about that and um, was, committed his life to making an incredible family for me and my, my brother and sister. And, um, and wanted nothing to do with any religious God talk or spirit talk. He was just all about taking care of your family and your community and what's right in front of you. And he was the most moral, upright man I knew. And later on, he became super spiritual and, and devout. But, um, but really, he set this example of, uh, you know, because I have it. I really honor my granddad and his cosmic vision. The most of my family, I'm on this all one unity trip. But I also am like primarily influenced by my dad, which is this, what are the pra practical, pragmatic ways you can make a difference in the world? And, uh, and being strategic about it. Um, so these are the cosmic principles uh, that we, uh, you know, I came in committing to run Bronner's like my granddad and my dad and mom before, after him, which was as an activist engine to make the world better, as a, to drive social and environmental change and make progress. Um, so um, uh, we, one of the first things we did is capped our executive salary. I could just see, like, I came in and we were at $5 million in revenue within a couple years. I could just see how things were going. And we committed to a five to one salary cap on all executives. So no matter how profitable the company gets, uh, uh, family executives will never make more than five times our lowest paid uh, fully vested position. So. Um, and so this past year, we crossed 122 million in revenue. Um, we're poised for another whole wave of growth, but I'm not gonna ever make more than I made uh, 20 years ago. And so basically all the profits we don't need to reinvest in the business are dedicated to the causes and charities and efforts that we believe in. Um, not, um, so these are the principles uh, that we kind of orientate around. And um, so work hard, grow, which is, you know, basically if we're not succeeding as a business and generating profit, 
Uh, nothing else is going to be happening here. Two, you know, making sure our customers are, are psyched. We're delivering quality soap and other products every time. Um, treat employees like family. We have a very generous uh, uh, benefits, no deductible health care, um, nice retirement uh, plan, and um, just generally good vibes. Um, uh, we have a free organic plant-based lunch every day, and then we subsidize the taco truck out front with grass-fed beef and pastured chicken. So people have to pay a normal price, but we subsidize the difference. Um, then, uh, yeah. <laughs> And then, I, and then these, the four, five, and six, are the, I think what I really want to talk about here is be fair to suppliers, treat the earth like home, and fun and fight for what's right. What I realized early on, I kind of came up at the same time the Guaya Key Cats came up, so, so David and Stephen Carr and Chris Mann and the other like, amazing uh, leaders at, at Guaya Key. And I remember you know, just meeting them and their amazing business model of, of going to market in partnership with the Guaya Key tribe in Paraguay and enabling them to sustainably produce yerba mate under the rainforest so that rainforest was uh, not under threat of being clear-cut. Um, their, their community had a sustainable livelihood, and you know, they're going to market in partnership, and everyone's winning. Every time you're buying their yerba mate, everyone is, is winning. And I realized, like, well, as cool as what we're doing and as biodegradable and awesome as our soaps are, is like we're buying our coconut oil and our olive oil from brokers on price and spec like everyone else and have no visibility into the growing conditions under which uh, the coconuts and the olives are being grown. And like, uh, you know, were their kids p picking the coconuts? You know, I didn't know. So, and just realizing is whatever coolness we're doing in our head operation, there's 10 times more people involved and impact involved in our supply chain. And it's like, you know, primarily our impact is a CPG, pretty much if it's soap or food or clothes or whatever, or cannabis. Um, it's your supply chain. It's, it's the farmers. It's the you know the ten times more people involved in your agricultural supply chain. What kind of deal are they getting? Are they getting exploited or are they being rewarded? And are you going? Are you in partnership? Or are you playing off farming and communities around the world against each other in a race to the bottom? And you know that's basically what's happening in the world. Is we have because everyone is being unconscious in how we're purchasing our raw materials. Basically, we we're rewarding these huge corporate industrial players who. For example, palm oil is a, is a key ingredient in our bar soap. Um, and, and, and palm oil, there's nothing intrinsic about palm that's bad. And let me, let me go to the next slide here. So, um, and I'll say, like, the first activist thing we did is put hemp seed oil into the soap in 1999. And I'd uh, gone to the Cannabis Cup in Amsterdam in 96 after college and have a, had a series of huge experiences uh, with, with psychedelics, uh, LSD and MDMA. Um, uh, as well as cannabis, and just really just re reorientated my life, just realized the, the miraculous love and light somehow at the heart of reality in, in the midst of the suffering and the absurdity that my granddad was absolutely right, and that's the deepest spiritual ground of our being. And, you know, viscerally realizing that and also realizing that cannabis was the sacrament of my people and that the drug war was a religious war in large part persecuting my people and... and um, we needed to free free the sacrament and free our people, and that you know as I was yeah. Um, and so hemp, you know, getting turned on to hemp, I committed myself to a vegan plant based diet, and uh, you know just woke up to the disaster of Western consumption on the planet, um, just wrecking entire ecosystems. We're living through the sixth great extinction event, you know, rural com communities around the world being dislocated and shredded and forced to become plantation workers. Um, that hemp was great. It was like at the nexus of, of can reforming cannabis and drug policy, uh, you know, moving, integrating psychedelics and cannabis as sacred allies. And then as far as the drugs, harder drugs, that we need to treat addiction as a health problem, and move to a compassionate health-based system and not criminalize uh, addiction and rather treat people rather than destroying their lives uh, uh, in, uh, with our drug policy. But you know, also waking up. Okay, how do we live in harmony with the with the earth? Like we're not doing it. Like how do, how do we how do we cultivate and feed ourselves and clothe ourselves in a way that's sustainable and harmonious with the earth? And so hemp was great. It's like right there at the nexus of both issues. You know, it's the most absurd example of an out of control drug war that would criminalize a, a non drug agricultural crop as a Schedule One substance. Um, and then also is grows like a weed. You don't need a lot of chemicals to, to bring it to harvest. It, it lends itself well to a regenerative organic 
uh, uh, crop rotation. And um, so it was just this perfect uh, ingredient to put in our soap. And, you know, we put it in right after Canada had recommercialized hemp. And we're confident that we were on the verge of doing so as well. But then we got Bush in 9-11, and he went nuts on all the medical dispensaries, industrial hemp, said we were all sitting on Schedule 1 inventory. So we got in this big fight with the DEA, and we're, um, we were supposed to dispose of all our inventory on February 6th of 2002. And we actually backed the DEA down as the first Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, backed the DEA down on February 5th. February 6th is Bob Marley's birthday. And two years later, so that was just our initial victory, but then we still had to have a series of other victories. And we had our, finally our clean final 3-0 unanimous victory in, in, in the Ninth Circuit on February 6th of 2004, so two years later. And so in, in parallel, um, we were uh, committing to going organic, okay? Like I met the Guayaquil guys and was inspired by a lot of other companies um, to take responsibility for our supply chains. So, but going organic wasn't enough. It was like, okay, we're going organic, but that still doesn't tell us what the social conditions are on these farms. Like what are the prices being paid? What are the working conditions? And organic's kind of about what you shouldn't do. It's not what you should do. Um, so we set out to identify direct trading relationships with farmers around the world producing our raw materials. And each one has a unique story. The first one was Serenipol in Sri Lanka. Right after the tsunami hit, we engaged. Our, our, our ace, Gary Lasone, had extensive networks in coconut fiber in Sri Lanka. And we were rebuilding fishing boats and sewing shops and helping restart the economy in, in these little microloan kind of ways. But I was like, you know, Gero, let's just source all our coconut oil here and just we'll, we'll buy a mill and partner with a thousand farmers and just go much bigger in our impact. So, uh, so we basically did that and uh, founded Serenipol with some really good local partners there. And, um, and uh, at this point, uh, are the number one exporter of virgin coconut oil out of Sri Lanka or of organic virgin coconut oil. Um, and yeah. So, um, and, and we were doing, uh, you know, we set up a huge compost program. We brought in experts to help the farmers like uh, implement best regenerative agricultural uh, techniques. Um, you know, what, what nitrogen fixing cover in, intercropping and what kind of crops do well with coconut and, um, you know, just, just getting them uh, nutrients and, and fertility in a really regenerative way. Um, and then palm oil, so palm oil being a very controversial crop. And realizing what hemp, like hemp symbolizes a way, it, it's not in and of itself the answer to our problems, but it symbolizes s sustainable regenerative agriculture at its best. But cannabis and hemp, as we all know, can be grown in a very unregenerative, not great way. It can be just grown in, indoors, under lights, fossil fuel intensive, chemical intensive. Palm oil, it likewise, can be grown in, a, in an entirely regenerative way as well. Uh, it's, a, um, it's a great crop. Um, it uh, actually produces more oil per acre uh, than any other. And if it's grown in a, in a regenerative way, it's actually really good. And we actually are now uh, got religion around dynamic ag forestry, which is where you uh, companion crop complementary tree species that replicate, replicate a natural ecosystem. Or if you look at a natural ecosystem in a forest, you've got tall trees, mid-level trees, bushes, and ground cover. Um, no, no chemical inputs. It's all self-regenerating. So, so we have palm and cocoa and banana and cassava, which is a ground cover. And planting that in a smart, like plant, understanding how the canopies fill in with the right distances between them and, and intensive pruning, uh, we're actually doubling the biomass, doubling the yields, doubling the incomes as doing these monocultures. Uh, of palm or of cocoa or banana, which are all very, very problematic when grown in a monoculture. But when you grow them in a smart interplanting, it actually minimizes weed and pest pressure. And you're, you know, you've got pollinator habitat and, and, and biodiverse habitat for wildlife. And it's just a win. Um, and uh, olive oil coming out of uh, Palestine. We've got 90% from the Palestinian side, 10% from the Israeli side. We got, and on the Israeli side, we're half Jewish, half, yeah, it's a Jewish family farm and an Arab Christian project. And then 90% Muslim Palestinians on the, in the West Bank. So Muslim, Christian, Jewish, olive oil, and our soap, all regenerative and really awesome. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so we got a lot, a lot of materials and stories that are rad. And, and we've partnered with Patagonia to, uh, 
to uh, and and leading soil health uh, to Rodale, the kind of godfather of the organic movement, um, uh, compassion world farming um, on animal welfare, pasture based livestock criteria. Like how do you how do we raise and kill animals in a way that they get to live a life they were evolved to live, um, and not a, a horse show where the best day of their life is their last, which is generally 99% of animals in this country are just you know living just in horrible conditions. It's an environmental nightmare. We're force feeding them GMO grains. They're not even evolved to eat uh, in the case of ruminant cattle. Um, so, but if we drastically lower that population of livestock, integrate them back into our farms, and we look at like a sustainable balance of animal and plant life like exists in a wild ecosystem, like we need to start farming in this way. And if everybody starts choosing this and paying like a reasonable premium, then realizing our, pl our plates of farm, our, our knives of butchering knife, or our forks of pitchfork, we're farmers. What does our farm look like? What's our section of the garden? And if we all take responsibility for that, we're going to terraform the earth in this awesome way. It's going to look a lot like around here. And uh, so that's, that's the vision of the regenerative organic standard. Um, so, bam. Um, and but because of federal prohibition, um, Cannabis farmers can't access a program with the term organic in it. So, uh, you know, we, we've been investing millions of dollars uh, 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 ending cannabis prohibition, first medical cannabis, and then, and then in, you know, 2012 in Colorado and um, uh, Washington, we broke through finally uh, after the 2010 uh, uh, Prop 19 uh, fiasco, but that also really showed the triggered the first national conversation about ending cannabis prohibition. That wasn't a big joke, um, and uh, you know, and then and in 2014, Adam Eidinger here, who's our director of social action, was the campaign manager in D.C. that legalized weed in the nation's capital, talking, of course, to our national leadership, um, and then in Oregon and Alaska, and then 2016, of course, here and a whole bunch of other states. Um, but with legalization, we saw these big corporate players moving in, displacing the small fa farmer ecosystem. Cannabis is just another flower, just like every other commodity. Is now we're seeing the same pressures coming in. So Sun and Earth is coming together, seeing, finding Flocana, reading Mikey, like, whoa, wow, this is the Dr. Bronner's of cannabis. This is exactly what we do with coconut oil in Sri Lanka. You know, we, we, we partner with farmers. We bring all the efficiencies uh, post-harvest. Um, you know, find customers. We're a big customer, but we're not the only customer. We have like 20 other customers. And um, so this was exactly the model we were looking for. And so Philconic, with them and leading farmers, uh, helped develop the Sun and Earth Certified Standard. Um, and this is, and then to promote it correctly, um, uh, we, uh, so these are the, the board members. Uh, so Certified Kind and Cannabis Conservancy were the, the kind of key certification partners and then the farmer partners here um, and, uh, and ourselves in Flocana. Um, but yeah, so it's all about certifying rock star farmers. That's like rock, you know, regenerative organic, certified rock. We're certifying rock star farmers and that's what Sun and Earth is doing. You know, we're going to partnership. We're celebrating our farmers and their flowers and, and their vibration and it's a, it's a beautiful thing. And so Brother David's is our not-for-profit brand platform. Like, what's, what's the most effective way of communicating about sun and earth is really to be in the store, talking to consumers, bud tenders, the trade, about sun and earth. And we're not-for-profit, to be clear, this is brand neutral. We want all our competition to also certify and partner with sun and earth cert, uh, certified farmers. So we'll be meeting up here just after the lecture series of circling up, whoever's interested in learning more and connecting more on sun and earth. Um, you know, we've got like some big plans once we do have a critical mass of like not just our brand and farmers and um, involved to do a big marketing campaign and push consumer facing marketing campaign for Sun and Earth, create this kind of demand that USD Organics been so successful creating. Um, and then, uh, so yeah, all, uh, this is Brother David's and, and uh, it's just a, a beautiful um, project and, and Les Sabo is our president. He's also the uh, director of constructive capital at Dr. Bronner's and oversees our philanthropy and just a super rock star. Um, and uh, so then another big thing we're doing here is my family is dedicating a million dollars a year to uh, uh, ending cannabis prohibition, so 2020. Um, our dream is 20 more states uh, will we'll legalize recreationally or medical. Um, and you know, these are the budgets. Basically, we're looking at a $31.5 million raise um, my family's putting in a million a year. About half of that will be cannabis-related. Uh, I'll talk about the other campaigns briefly, but here's the adult 
this is the battle map um, uh, from New Approach. Um, so dull use now, and then the, the, the red states are the for sure battlegrounds, and then the pink states are the hope long shot if enough money is raised uh, states, and then medical. And then the idea, obviously, if we win all these states, then we'll have a majority uh, in the Senate and the House of senators and representatives and can finally end the, the charade once and for all at a federal level. That's the dream. So, and, yeah. And, um, you know, in just 2020 is going to be an amazing year. I mean, the, 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 obviously the voters are mo going to mobilize and go to the polls on numbers like non never before. Kids, the youth demographic that tends to vote so progressive in our way, there's a real opportunity here. So there's three other measures just to put on people's r radar. On Friday, uh, I just uh, joined Paul Stamets and uh, Thomas Shree Eckert uh, up in Portland to announce our 150K uh, donation to, um, to the signature drive for the Psilocybin Service Initiative of Oregon. Yeah. So, so this is going to set up a regulated program for all adults to access psilocybin therapy. You don't need a clinical diagnosis of major depressive disorder um, uh, to access it. And as important as the FDA route is, and I'm on the board of MAPS, and we're giving $5 million to move MDMA through uh, FDA approval process for treatment-resistant PTSD, crucial work, and psilocybin's moving in parallel for major depressive disorder. Uh, these are going to be very expensive th therapies to access when it's not for those qualifying conditions. Insurance will cover it for the condition, but not off-label. And so this is a, and I basically bringing the existing underground therapeutic community above ground uh, and putting really good regulations around licensing and uh, licensing and training uh, facilitators, um, screening applicants, making sure there's adequate preparation, and then integration, uh, you know, optimizing set and setting for, for ideal therapeutic outcomes. And just amazing work can be done with these medicines, you know, just huge amounts of, uh, you know, just really difficult emotional emotions and experiences and traumas and behavioral patterns. You can just really reset. And uh, so um, one of the jokes back in the day when a reporter would say, like, about hemp, like, isn't, isn't hemp just a stocking horse for marijuana? And, uh, you know, the official answer was, like, yeah, some of us want to end cannabis prohibition, but I'm in coalition with farmers who just want to grow fiber and seed, blah, blah. Um, but, you know, obviously that, it was about creating cultural space for, for cannabis in part, but the joke was, no, get it right, this is about LSD. And uh, so, <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, I, I guess that's, I'm, I'm way out of time. So, uh, but thank you guys. Bam. Yeah. <laughs>